Hello, everyone. My name is Samantha Fink, and I am the president of the Salem State University Scuba Club. I'm very excited to announce the speaker we have chosen to sponsor for this year's Darwin Festival, who will be speaking to us about humanity's role in the destruction and maintenance of biodiversity. This topic is something that is incredibly relevant to every person on our planet as we reach a point in our Earth's ecosystem that has never before been approached. Dr. Kaufman is a professor of biology at Boston University and has spent his life doing research in the fields of marine biology, evolutionary ecology, and conservation biology. He is currently doing work studying the degradation and regenerative, regenerative processes of coral reefs, as well as observing the biophysical processes that concern the fundamental dynamics of coupled human natural systems. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a Salem State welcome to Dr. Les Kaufman. Thank you, Samantha. Let me get my presentation up. There, how's that, everybody? Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm really honored to be uh, one of the Darwin speakers this year and also have strong affection for Salem State. Some of my buddies are there. Um, and uh, it's especially nice to be talking about this topic immediately after returning from Belize uh, for my first time after COVID. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what we do in my lab uh, so you'll understand the context for the rest of the talk. Um, I'm really interested in the evolutionary processes that create diversity. So speciation, hybridization, uh, selection, all of that. Uh, and I have in the past worked in the lab, but I'm mostly a field biologist. And my specialty areas are coral reefs around the world, but particularly the Caribbean. That's a picture of Fiji though. Uh, in tropical Great Lakes, but especially Lake Victoria, East Africa. And that's one of our newly discovered species from there. And at home in Massachusetts, where I work heavily on Stellwagen Bank, uh, particularly with the National Marine Sanctuary. But all of this, in one way or another, is related to the relationship between people and nature, and at a larger scale between society and the biosphere. And as Samantha mentioned, we're at kind of a critical juncture. That's not news to anybody. And I'm involved in some of the science to support the transition to renewable energy. But uh, anything we do has legions of like incredible number of consequences. Everybody's got their own needs and their needs are differently affected by modifications to the biosphere. And that's what we're gonna be looking into in some detail. The book that inspired my career and, and much of modern ecology is by this guy, G.E. Hutchinson. And uh, GE was, uh, or the Hutch, as we called him, was one of the fathers of modern ecology. And he wrote a book of essays in 1965 called The Ecological Fear and the Evolutionary Play, which I highly recommend to you. And in, this, uh, in these essays, Hutchinson explored the origins of biodiversity and more importantly, perhaps, the origins of our awareness of how evolution works. And the title, is really uh, trenchant because it, it refers to the fact that evolution is occurring every day. It's playing out right before our eyes. It's not some slow, ponderous process that takes millions and millions of years. That's only something you see in retrospect. Now, one of the things that's happening globally is the annihilation of a critical habitat it's frequently said that coral reefs, this is a close-up of a coral reef in, where was I? Oh man, oh, this was in the Phoenix Islands. Anyway, um, coral reefs are said to harbor 25% of the diversity in the ocean. I, to tell you the truth, I don't know where that number came from. <laughs> Friends of mine keep repeating it, but there's a lot of stuff there. Coral, <coughs> coral reefs are structures built along mostly tropical shorelines, uh, constructed in part by animals that look like sea anemones that secrete a hard skeleton. So what you're seeing here are plant-like growth forms, 
each of which consists of thousands and thousands of individual tiny polyps, uh, what we would call an individual, but they're bound together in a colony and they secrete limestone and they build coral reefs. And coral reefs are critical to people because they supply food, livelihoods in the form of tourism, protection from storms so your house doesn't wash away, and just inspiration with their phenomenal diversity of corals, fishes, algae, and other animals. But beginning in, oh, I'd say the late 1970s, coral reefs around the world began to decline precipitously. And the reason for this is first and foremost, anthropogenic climate change. Corals exist very close to the upper lethal thermal limit. They're happiest just below it. So if we push it up even a little bit, bad things start to happen. Warming of the ocean causes the corals to part ways with their um, community of symbiotic algae that imbue them with their plant-like superpowers. But that's not the only thing going on. I mean, along all these shorelines there are burgeoning human populations and their need for protein is extreme. They're overfishing. They have been for hundreds of years. People create coastal pollution. They mine the reef for limestone, for building materials. Um, and at the same time, a host of global climate change related things are going on. It's getting warm. This bleaching occurs where the corals lose their algae. If they don't get it back in four or five days, they die. Warming also promotes the growth of pathogens like bacteria and accelerates coral disease. It also helps build super cyclones. The heat in the water is the food for large cyclonic storms. These can devastate coral reefs and require decades to recover. And finally, the ocean is becoming more acidic and this makes it hard to secrete limestone. And all the marine organisms, corals, clams, snails, everything with a shell made of calcium carbonate, they're having a rough time now. Even the oyster industry has been suffering on account of this. Now, this is what the Phoenix Islands looked like uh, before the year 2002. This is a friend of mine, that's Rob Burrell, who heads the boat that we work off in Fiji, the Naya. Here he is swimming over a field of what are called tabulate or table-like corals. These are in the genus Acropora, and you'll be hearing a lot about Acropora in a minute. This is a pristine coral reef. We were astounded when we first saw this. It's located, this particular picture is from very close to where Amelia Earhart probably ditched. Um, there's a lot of evidence for it, but we're gonna pay attention to corals for a minute. You see the little, little dead area over here? Death is normal on a coral reef. The corals keep up with, uh, with the growth of the reef by fending off predators and disease and by being aided by environments that are more favorable to coral growth and the growth of other organisms like seaweed. Um, they're constantly besieged by predators and uh, physical damage. But it's amazing. I mean, they're made of stone, but they actually grow very quickly. One of these tables can grow half a meter a year out in you know all directions. And so when a reef is destroyed by, say, a hurricane, the corals are adapted to recover in as little as 15 years. They could completely recarpet the reef. But it happens uh, only if they have time to do it. This is a heat map of the Central Pacific Ocean. You can see here a little black box. That was for a time the largest marine protected area in the world. It's called the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. There are eight atolls, coral atolls in that region. And we have been studying it since uh, that first discovery of these beautiful communities in the early 2000s. Uh, I was out there in 2009 with a large expedition. Currently, the research team for the Phoenix Islands is being led by Randy Rochin at BU. Now, the Phoenix Islands are part of a vast, far-flung nation 
called Kiribati. They are the central of three island groups, but these are almost uninhabited. In this vast region live 24 people on the island of Canton, just to make sure that everybody remembers that Kiribati owns these islands. We were successful as a community in getting this large area protected uh, from fishing and other disturbances, but the Chinese have now tried to bargain to buy the park back uh, to establish uh, fishing rights and military bases. So there's a lot of politics going on literally in the middle of nowhere. Now, what this heat map shows was a warming event that occurred in 2002 and 2003, just after the first expedition to the Phoenix Islands to look at coral reefs. And the Phoenix Islands protected area is ground zero for this heating. The water was lethally high temperature for corals for seven months. And this is what happened. Um, this is a field of staghorn coral that was utterly destroyed by the bleaching. Now, all the fishes that require live coral are missing in this picture. What you see are snappers and grunts that feed off the reef and zooplanktivores. You can see those little purple dots. That's, those are purple queens. They're a little, a little grouper. And they rise above the reef and feed on plankton. That blue thing in the middle, I'm not certain. I think it's a parrotfish, but it could also be a piece of plastic. And um, you see very few of those right now until algae begins to grow on the dead coral, and then hordes of parrotfish and surgeonfish come in to graze the algae. But you can see, starting up this, <laughs> this reef again is a big job. <laughs> now that's the Central Pacific. The story is much more sobering in the Caribbean. This is a, a wide angle shot uh, taken by a machine similar to the one that they do the Google, you know, Google Street View thing with. They made it so it could go underwater. So this is a Google Street View of what was once a coral reef in Bonaire. And in the lower right, you can see a little bit of an inset there of a person diving on a field of dead staghorn. That's what this would have looked like before it all fell apart. Coral disintegrates very, very rapidly after it dies because of a host of organisms that bore into its skeleton. As soon as the coral dies, they get the upper hand. So this is, this is pretty bleak, bleakaroni. But there are things that we can do to change the nature of the world that our children see. Now, going from this to some of these pictures here can take as little as 10 years, but it requires a massive effort. Beginning in 2017, a group of us organized something called the Coral Restoration Consortium to see what we could do about providing better stewardship for coral reefs until the climate change issues became resolved. Now let's put this stuff in perspective. According to NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US, we have so overshot our climate goals that it is going to take about three to 400 years to come back to an earth that can be friendly to coral reefs again. This is phenomenal and, and very troubling. What that means is that if we want our children to see coral reefs, we're gonna to have to facilitate their existence. We're gonna to have to make up for the stressors that they're experiencing. Now, Ken Nedemeyer, is a former fish collector, aquarium fish collector in Florida. He was generating what we call live rock by putting hunks of rock out and uh, letting all the organisms recruit to them. And these rocks are used as filters in home aquaria because they have a piece of the whole system's biology of a coral reef. So Ken was generating live rock for the aquarium trade by taking boulders from a quarry in the Keys and dumping them in the ocean and waiting a few years. Then he could sell it for like, you know, $20 a pound. Anyway, while the rocks were out there, you see this branch of coral? <coughs> that's, called, that's called staghorn. 
Staghorn is also an acroporid coral, and its buddy in the back here, the big broad blades, that's elkhorn. They're both in the genus Acropora, like the one we saw in the Pacific. These corals are the major shallow water structure builders in the entire tropical West Atlantic, except for Brazil. Both of these corals are now on the endangered species list. Can you believe that? I mean, they covered thousands and thousands of acres of shallow bottom all through the Caribbean. And they protected the shoreline. They provided food. They supported the tourism industry, all of that. And they generated the very sand on the beach. Tropical beach sand comes from parrotfish poop. Parrotfish grind up the coral in their pharyngeal jaw and poop out the sand that people pay thousands of dollars to lie on. So in Florida, Ken found this coral growing on his live rock. That made it illegal immediately to sell the live rock. So he got permission to break off the coral and glue it to the actual reef. And when he did this, he found out that he could actually do it a lot and he could bring the reef back, at least in terms of the cover of fast growing acropore corals. Ken and Dave Vaughn, who you see on the right, Dave learned how to propagate massive corals, big boulder corals, by cutting them into tiny little bits, putting them on a dead coral colony or on a some kind of concrete framework. And in as little as five years, with the coral growing and all the pieces connecting up, he could reproduce the equivalent of a 100-year-old colony. And it became sexually mature in five years instead of, a, instead of 50 years. And it was able to begin contributing to re, revegetating or recoraling the coral reefs. So we've, in the last 10 or 15 years, translated a technology developed for the home aquarium industry into a, a, a viable way of restoring patches of coral reef, like the one you see here in Belize, uh, done by the Organization of Fragments of Hope, who I work closely with. This area was rubble 10 years ago. Now it's a spectacular coral reef. Not only that, this is Laughing Bird Key, Belize. It's a national park. It's one of the most important tourist sites in Central America. <coughs> So the, so the question was, could we take all we've learned and spread it around the world? <laughs> but soon we realized the world is changing. We can't guarantee that we can keep on uh, restoring coral reefs when the problem is getting harder and harder to attack. So the real question now is, can the organisms keep up? And this is where evolution comes in. So the question is, can evolution be used as a tool to conserve coral reefs? Well, there are at least four ways that this has begun to happen. The first is to understand the evolution of all of the coral reef organisms, everything that contributes to a functioning reef. And with that insight, with that knowledge, decide who is most critical to put back, in what order, to trigger the regeneration of a reef where one formerly existed. So this is like, uh, it's like a puzzle, like a jigsaw puzzle. And the question is where are the right pieces and where are the organisms that are critical to each other's survival and that have co-evolved in order to support each other. The second approach is something called facilitated evolution. As I mentioned <laughs> before, <laughs> Pardon me. As I've mentioned before, evolution is not really such a slow process, but it's not going fast enough to keep up with the rate at which people are altering Earth's climate. So can we accelerate this evolution? And we'll talk about that in a moment. A third approach is genetic engineering, and that's to go directly into the genome and modify it in such a way that the organism's fitness is enhanced. Curiously, a lot of the methods of genetic engineering available now, which are very powerful, were developed with something very different in mind. 
It was developed with the thought of causing something you don't want to go extinct. That's called gene drive. And I led a workshop in Italy last June to ask, should we use gene drive in conservation or is it too dangerous? The other thing going on with corals is the generation of so-called super corals by putting thermally resistant genes, things that enable the corals to survive in warmer water, putting it into their genome and spreading it through the population. The fourth approach is biological control. And that is the use of living agents or, or viruses, which are not really alive, to modify coral reef organisms so that they're better able to deal with the changing world. <clears throat> it, it was in the Phoenix Islands that this evolutionarily informed restoration happened, but we just observed it. We didn't actually do anything but measure what was going on. In the Phoenix Islands, there were large sharks. They're still abundant. Most of the world, they've been eliminated. Um, these sharks eat medium-sized predators that eat surgeon fish and parrotfish. So with the sharks present, you have good conditions for large populations of surgeon fish and parrotfish, which eat soft algae. That soft algae competes with a hard alga called crustose coral and algae. So if you have more CCA or crustose coral and algae, you're going to have a good substratum for corals to settle, and it becomes a coral nursery. So sharks eat groupers. Absence of groupers, lots of parrotfish and surgeon fish. Presence of herbivores, soft algae gone, coral and algae present. Coral and algae present, the bacteria living on the surface of coral and algae emit pheromones that call the baby corals in, they settle and the reef is reestablished in as little as 15 to 20 years. So understanding this dynamic was critical in innovations in coral reef restoration that we could apply elsewhere. So for example, in Puerto Rico, this is a reef spur, uh, a mound, off Fajardo in Eastern Puerto Rico that NOAA decided they were gonna restore after a hurricane. And in only a few years, look at what they had. Acres and acres of staghorn coral of many different genets. Of course, you're tracking the genetic constitution of the population while you're putting these little corals out and growing them out. And you want as much genetic diversity as possible because that gives you the best insurance policy against unforeseen things like a new storm or a new bleaching event or a new disease. I'm very proud of my colleagues in Puerto Rico at the Newer Restoration Center for this fantastic work, which was completely destroyed by Hurricane Maria. The point being, that's natural. Well, the hurricanes are a little stronger than they would be otherwise, but because there aren't enough coral reef or coral populations remaining close enough to each other to repopulate areas like, like the one we just saw, we have to facilitate recruitment. We have to find a way to keep coral regenerating quickly in islands that may be too far from each other for larval recruitment to occur. We call this recruitment limitation. And that would be the death knell of coral reefs unless we can get around it. The most spectacularly successful coral reef restoration program in the world at the moment is in Belize. In Belize. It's led by a woman named um, Lisa Karn, who I just spent a couple of delightful weeks with. And uh, these are stop action photos of a section of Laughing Bird called uh, Plot 13 which we've been studying for many years. And here it is after it was utterly destroyed. She put some coral out, it began to grow. Here's a little Acropora pomata there. Here is six years later, lots of fish are coming in, including food fish like, like this schoolmaster. <coughs> this was April, 2020. That patch of reef is completely restored but it's restored only with members of the genus Acropora. The next hurricane will do to Laughing Bird, if it's strong enough, 
what happened in Puerto Rico. And Lisa will be out there planting corals again because waiting for them to recruit will take too long. The system can convert from a coral reef to something else, become recalcitrant, and be very hard then to recover as a coral reef. Now we've begun to study this process by creating what are called photomosaics. We swim over the reef, taking thousands of pictures of the reef from every angle with an SLR camera. We can even use a GoPro, but a, a good SLR is better. And now with computers, we can seam all those pictures together into what we call an ortho mosaic, a 2D mosaic, and then using uh, information about from the from the three dimensionality of the photographs, we can drape a 3D cover over that photo mosaic and pull it up again so that it becomes a three dimensional model of the reef. And this fantastic technology is now being applied in a standardized way all over the world. And we are trying to find out how to extract information about ecological processes from it. This mosaic that you see on the bottom depicts in orange the spread of Elkhorn coral on one of our plots. Now, just last week, I took these pictures in the Placencia Keys at Laughing Bird and Moho Key. And you can see the result now of a fully regenerated portion of coral reef. 20% of the national park now has been entirely restored. We're at the point where unless something untoward happens, these corals will propagate on their own and fill out the rest of the park. But just to be sure, and in concert with our latest NSF grant, we're gonna be planting out thousands of new Elkhorn coral to see if we can induce the formation of one of those Elkhorn coral barricades that used to protect the shorelines of all of these islands. This piece of coral is four years old. It began as a tiny little thing cut out by David Vaughn, this big. And uh, that was only four years ago and now it's sexually mature. It's beginning to branch out and it is producing larvae to settle nearby. Now, when you restore an ecosystem or you facilitate its restoration, I should say, the good things come in stages and it's very important that you think about how you're gonna scale your operation. Now, already, we can recreate patches of reef on the order of tens of square meters. And this can provide value for a hotel. It restores all the snorkeling that they need, and that can actually account for a third to a half of their business. People wanting to, among other things, snorkel on a coral reef when they get to Belize or wherever. When you scale it up to hundreds of square meters, you're finally at the point we are producing a viable coral population that can then repopulate other areas. When you get to thousands of square meters, you're talking about a metapopulation, patches of coral that can rescue each other if one dies. You're also now getting the benefits of tourism, education, biodiversity maintenance, and coastal protection. As you increase the scale of the restoration, you get to the point where the reef is once again, not only able to protect the shoreline, but to provide a source of sand to keep the beach in place. A lot of coral restoration right now is still at this very early stage, but there's a project in Florida called Mission Iconic Reefs that aspires to restore the value of seven of our Floridian coral reef patches. Um, in such a way that the economy of the Florida Keys is bolstered and supported. And we'll see how that goes. Now, the, one of the most interesting things we've learned, these are all pictures from Belize. One of the interesting things we've learned is that it's not corals alone that build the reef, it's amalgams. Remember the coral itself is a, is a complex organism. It has an animal, it has algae, it has bacteria, all together, that's what a coral is, not when those things are apart. But the corals themselves interact with each other and with algae 
in ways that we didn't really appreciate before. For example, this picture in the lower right is a cutaway of a reef created by an earthquake that shows the internal framework of Elkhorn coral. And all this pink stuff you see is crustose coral and algae. In fact, there's another kind of reef crest that you see in the upper right created by a delicate coral called lettuce coral. But as the lettuce coral grows, coral and algae grows with it, creating a much stronger and more durable structure. <clears throat> okay, facilitated evolution is an example where you try to accelerate the appearance of individuals that are better suited to the new environment. And we do this usually in a non-genetic fashion by getting as much diversity as we can, all different genetically unrelated corals of a given species, and we put them together in what's called a common garden experiment. Then as the earth warms up, that's what we're showing you here, some of the corals die, some of the corals live. You take the ones that live and propagate them out and use them in restoration. So we're, we're engaging evolution as an aid to push things forward toward organisms better adapted to our warmer, more acidic oceans. And what you're seeing here are tables for rearing out these corals of all different genotypes until you see what happens. Now, now the other way to do it is to actually introduce what we feel will be adaptive genes to the coral and then propagate the genetically engineered corals. And this approach was pioneered by Ruth Gates at the University of Hawaii. Unfortunately, we lost Ruth <laughs> a few years ago. And this is what Ruth was doing, trying to genetic engineer super corals. <laughs> now, in the midst of all this, other things are going on. This animation depicts the death of all, almost all massive corals, all boulder-shaped corals on the Florida reef beginning in 2014, when right here, happenstance would be that it was at the Miami sewer outfall, we began to see corals turning white and dying, and it wasn't due to anything we knew of before. This horrible disease has since swept north into Broward County and south, now it's reached the dry tortugas and it's going off uh, into the Caribbean. It's going down the coast of Central America. It's already appeared in the Eastern Caribbean and 21 to 30 species of coral that are absolutely essential to the foundation of the reef are all dying. This is one of the, one of the worst things to hit Caribbean reefs uh, since we saw things heading south in the late 1970s. It's called Skittle D, stony coral tissue loss disease. And the question is, what can we possibly do about it? And at what scale? These plastered corals have a, a paste of amoxicillin that has been placed around the edges of the dying portions of the colony. And it's been discovered uh, and pioneered by Karen Neely in Florida, that if you do this repeatedly, you can arrest the infection and the coral can regenerate. But imagine the work that went into this one coral colony, this one dicasenia colony, and multiply that by billions of colonies. This is not a practical way to save a coral reef. Um, I'm working with folks in Dominica over the last eight months. We got them the antibiotic. It's hard to get the antibiotic now. You can't even get it for your kids. There's a supply chain shortage. And here we are putting it into paste and smearing it on, on corals. Another way that we could potentially control coral diseases that are spurred by global warming is by attacking the pathogen itself. Bacteria are subject to viral infections, and the viruses that attack bacteria are called phage, bacteriophage. And there are labs now looking into the possibility of using a bacteriophage against bacterial coral disease. 
<laughs> the problem is when we don't know what causes the disease, you don't know what therapy to develop. In the case of Skittle D, we do not know the cause. There are at least 20 labs working on it. It is transmissible. It appears it might have something to do with virus <coughs> that it attacks symbiotic algae, but we don't know. So we're just watching, we're basically watching the building fall. Now, one of the other insights that's come from all this work is the recognition that we were over-focused on individual coral reefs. Really, the coral reef is part of an ecological landscape and you need to preserve the entire landscape if you want the coral reef to survive. This is a picture of a tiny part of the Mesoamerican barrier reef in Belize. You can see it consists of a barrier, a barrier reef here. Can you see my cursor? Okay. And then these are all patch reefs in the middle of the lagoon. And out here, you can barely see the beginning of an atoll. Here it again is a picture of the barrier. The yellow, tiny, thin strand is Elkhorn coral. Behind this barrier, seagrass grows. Seagrass is essential to manatees. Mangrove trees grow. Mangroves have roots underwater festooned with a fantastically diverse community of fishes and invertebrates. And above water, they provide a windbreak and a wave break that can help preserve the shoreline. So that's what we're about now. We have a large NSF grant with the University of South Florida to study how this mosaic works and how coral reef restoration can play into it. Now, on an even bigger scale, people don't just live on a reef. They don't just live in a reef system. They live in what Polynesians refer to as a honua or a vonua. This is the entirety of the ecosystem from ridge to open ocean that supplies people's needs. And that interacts internally, the whole thing needs to be intact. And it looks similar wherever you go, from mountains <laughs> to freshwater systems, to coastal estuaries, to coral reefs or other lush marine invertebrate communities. So I also looked at the Vanua of Lake Victoria, East Africa. This is the second largest lake in the world. On land, there are remnants of rainforest. This is Kakamega Forest. And in the lake, which is essentially an inland sea, are hundreds of species of fish that evolved in C2 in a very short time. The lake itself is the result of the rising up of the mountains of the moon the, the, in Rwanda and Uganda and the Congo. And it caused a back ponding of the upper reaches of the Congo River, forming Lake Victoria in a depression that once looked like the Serengeti. It had lions and elephants and giraffes. And now it has this other kind of lion. This is an introduced fish called the Nile perch that was placed in the lake to turn all the native little fish that had evolved into these hundreds of colorful species, they needed to be turned, according to the fisheries department, into rectangular white fish fillets. And introducing Nile perch was a way to do it. So this is an example where evolutionary informed restoration might work. The Kakamega Forest Reserve is the easternmost outpost of the Congolese rainforest and part of the watershed of Lake Victoria. It's also in the tea growing district and a great deal of native forest was destroyed in order to grow the tea. Years ago, someone had the idea that you could use, that the tea plantation could benefit from a forest buffer and that they could actually behave symbiotically with the forest providing pest control and the tea plantation providing a border so the forest doesn't get encroached. This is the forest full of monkeys and other wildlife. And these are the tea bushes. The amazing thing here, when I went to Kakamega most recently in 2019, was that this edge of the forest that the last time I'd been there was open, like a wound, had been closed. 
and it was closed by a particular species of tree that you can see here called celery tree or umbrella tree, Polyseus. It's a very fast growing, light demanding tree. That tree turned out to be the secret to the preservation of Kakamega Forest by sealing off the edge of the forest and protecting it from winds and encroachment. This tree is the Elkhorn coral of the East African rainforest. Now it can be used deliberately and is being used deliberately. In Lake Victoria, evolution is still happening at a prodigious pace. Uh, these are fish that we caught on our 2017 survey of the lake, the first biodiversity survey of the entire lake. These are all in a group called haplochromine cichlids, but you can see they eat so many different kinds of things and their teeth are different. Um, this middle one, which crushes snails in its mouth, Platyteniotis degani, it actually turns out that the original species described in this ecological type is extinct or missing. Instead, there is a new species that is a hybrid between two of the other genera that is now very abundant in the lake. In other words, we watched the evolution of a new species. That's how quickly it can happen. Now, what Lake Victoria has taught us about evolution is that similar forms can appear over and over again in a group of animals that share a common genetic heritage. All of these fishes are at least distantly related. And in Lake Victoria, there is a zooplanktivore that feeds near the bottom, one that feeds up in the water column. In Lake Malawi, bottom, water column. On an Indo-Pacific coral reef, bottom, water column. In Lake Tanganyika, bottom, water column. The same body forms and behaviors appearing over and over again through evolutionary parallelism. There are also highly threatened food fishes in Lake Victoria, like these two species of tilapia, Mbiru here with an orange rim on the tail, and Ngege. They're about to become dinner. When one of our lab techs showed up with a basin full of these two gravely endangered species, I freaked out. First of all, where did he get them? Second of all, why did he kill so many? These things are endangered. Well, to be honest with you, I've eaten both of them and they're my favorites. Where they occur, they're still very abundant. They just don't occur in many places. What Lake Victoria is also teaching us about evolution is that even forms that look identical can be independently derived. These are the red and blue form of a fish called the zebra, Punamilia. There are two species, Punamilia Punamilia, which means zebra zebra in Swahili, and Punamilia Nyeriri, which means the zebra of our teacher, Nyeriri, uh, who was the first prime minister of Tanzania. Now, these both occur all around Lake Victoria, but the blue one, it turns out, based on genetic work by Ole Sehausen, the blue one in any place is independently derived. So the blue one and the red one who live together are each other's closest relative. And the blue one you have here is not related closely to the blue one over there. So this evolutionary event, the divergence into a red form and a blue form occurred over and over and over again all around the lake. One species, Isochromus argens, which is extremely endangered, is the major midwater uh, uh, zooplanktivore. And this is one of the species we've taken into a captive breeding program to try and restore it to the lake eventually. That silver one at the bottom with the label A is Isochromus argens. Now, one of the best ways to do conservation and to promote adaptive evolution is to harmonize the relationship between people and these species. So we now have a project in Kenya to take the native tilapia as well as the introduced Nile tilapia and propagate them on fish farms. And we're working with several local NGOs and foundations and Conservation International 
to use this as an engine for technical training and to engage women in the workforce. How many, of, I don't know if you've seen the film Darwin's Nightmare. It's by a friend, Hubert Sauper about Lake Victoria. One of the things that's gone wrong there is that with the Nile perch fishery exploding, it required modern factories and industry to process because it's efficient, it has to be filleted and refrigerated. Uh, women used to get the frames of the Nile perch from the processing factory to still try to make something they can sell because the fish they used to sell were now very rare. Soon, the men were requiring that the women have sex with them in order to give them anything that they could sell. HIV exploded. So one of the main solutions here is to get women into managerial positions in the workforce so they don't have to do that kind of thing. And that's what we're trying to do now with a farm called Victory Farms in Southern Kenya and with the Calestis Drumas Legacy Foundation in Northern Kenya. Uh, and of course, we also have organizations we have established to tie the three countries around the lake together. So evolution can be very helpful. Uh, if you understand the dynamics of a human natural coupled system, this is from a paper we published several years ago with our Dutch colleagues, depicting how people and the ecosystem of the lake are related. We also model the biophysical side of the system this is a simple loop model, but I now need a lead a modeling team that does dynamic scenario forecasting uh, in the United States and elsewhere for things like the big wind build out that we're starting now on our continental shelf. Cage aquaculture can provide a solution in Lake Victoria, harmonizing protein production, food security, with biodiversity conservation, because these farms actually serve as refugia for the endangered, rapidly evolving cichlids in Lake Victoria. <clears throat> it provides all these benefits and is a vehicle to further our conservation work by engaging local communities in it. So, the bottom line here is that evolution is not just of academic interest is not just something to wonder about. It's a dynamic process that is the key to achieving sustainable development goals. It's only through an understanding of evolution that we can uh, design systems that are adaptive, that play well as part of the ecosystem, and that instead of diminishing foster resilience, in this increasingly violent world. And uh, this is really the secret to developing a sustainable economy and a good quality of life that's more equitably accessible to all the people of the world. Thank you. Dr. Kaufman, thank you very much for this very engaging talk. If, oh, there you go. Before yep. we open up the Q&A, I know our uh, Scuba Club president, uh, Samantha Fink, wanted to make a quick announcement. So Samantha, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that today at 4.30 in Meyer Hall 444, um, we're going to be having a little Valentine's Day Darwin Festival hot chocolate social event. And we'll also be selling our shirts for $18 there. So we hope to see everyone there to come get some hot chocolate and learn more about the Scuba Club. Great. Thank you, Samantha. Dr. Kaufman, the first question that I have from the audience is, can you explain to us why coral reefs don't exist in colder climates? Oh, well, actually they do. They exist in the deep sea and they exist in the far north of uh, Norway, uh, the south of Chile, and places like that. But those coral reefs are very, very slow growing, growing because they're in the dark, and they're more like a veneer of coral. If they have millennia to grow, 
they can accumulate a fair amount of limestone too. For example, there's a coral reef in northern Florida that's composed of uh, a non-symbiotic form of a coral called Oculina. And it's a very important habitat for snapper fishing. <coughs> now that, that deep coral reef has actually been uh, largely destroyed by trawlers mm -hmm. who are trying to fish on a larger scale commercially. Uh, once you destroy that kind of a reef, it's pretty much gone in a human time scale. But tropical reefs grow faster, and there's a real possibility of dancing with them, of pulling them through this climate hiatus that we're going to see of three to 400 years. Interesting. Um, while our audience, oh, I think there is another Here, one. Here's another question. Uh, what was the name of the tree that uh, you mentioned from the Kakamega? Kakamega Forest Reserve. I, I can put that in the, is there a chat? Oh, no there chat. is no chat, unfortunately. Okay, it's called Polycias, P-O-L-Y-S-C-I-A-S. -S, and there are several species of it. Uh, common name, the most commonly used common name is umbrella tree. Um, but it's representative of a functional group of tropical trees called posilayer. In other words, there are very few layers of leaves. They have like an umbrella canopy. And there are other posilayer trees that serve the same purpose. If you've been in the American tropics, there's something called the trumpet tree, Cecropia, that does the same thing. It seals off opened edges of the forest. Thanks for that, Dr. Kaufman. I have another question and I'll read this straight to you. Was the organization Fragments of Hope involved in the restoration in Belize or the Phoenix Islands? Ah, uh, Fragments of Hope is uh, a registered NGO in Placencia, Belize. And um, it, uh, it's led by Lisa Karn. And originally it was focused only on the Placencia Keys and Laughing Bird Key. And since that time, it's essentially becoming the national coral restoration program for Belize. Um. I have another question. Are there more corals that can secrete uh, calcium carbonate? Um, are you Is that being selected for as you sort of engineer um, the corals? Ah, that's a really good question. So um, Anne Cohen at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute has been closely studying the effect of ocean acidification on skeletal building in corals. And there are some corals that are better able to cope with acidic waters than others. And so if there really is to be such a thing as a super coral, it'll have to have that, a, that capability as well. But the other thing we're learning when we compare genetic engineering to our common garden experiments, you know, for selection, we're finding that coevolution among genes is very, very important. So just sticking a good gene in doesn't mean the whole genome is going to work the way you expect it to. Another it's question. A oh. It's much more complicated. <laughs> hmm. Another question for you, Dr. Kaufman, um, considering we have many students in our audience, is how can each of us support these coral restoration projects? Well, um, you're in a university, and I think the best way to support it is to become a scientist, but I'm a little bit biased. I can tell you, I can tell you that. Um, the kind of new mold for a field biologist is kind of more along the lines of um, what was what was the movie with um, oh god I remember fish names but not movies now uh, <laughs> the guy who searched for medicine in the rainforest um, it was played by um, by James Bond actually by Daniel Craig. No, not that one, the earlier one, way uh, earlier. The first Sean, one. Con Sean, Connery. Sean Connery plays, a med it's called Medicine Man is the name of the movie. Oh, that's right, yeah. Right, so he's going through the rainforest to try to find potential sources of new medications, but at the same, <laughs> at the same time, he becomes involved in saving the forest itself. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that's really become essential. I mean, scientists 
to no longer be aloof. So, so my advice would be become a scientist, but be politically savvy and learn as much as you can about people as well. They're the really complicated hard nut to crack. <laughs> There's another question from is the organization hiring or looking for help? So ah, fragments, to... fragments of Hope is always looking for help. However, um, it tends to focus on hiring Belizeans so that the people doing coal restoration are making their living at it. Mm -hmm. um, however, in the US, there are many opportunities to volunteer for people working in Florida and the Virgin Islands. And in Florida in particular, there's an organization called the Coral Restoration Foundation, CRF. And they take volunteers. And I think Moat Marine Lab is also taking volunteers. Um, so you need to be scuba certified. Uh, and uh, they put you through your paces. And then you participate in helping to glue the coral down, basically. But there are many other jobs. We need more people for PR, for interpretation, for running the gift shop. We sell t-shirts too. I don't want to compete with your t-shirts. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I would say the big opportunities right now are in Florida. And the Moat Aquarium, I believe, is in Sarasota, right? The what aquarium? The Moat Aquarium is in yeah, Sarasota, Yeah, the Moat Aquarium. Right? I'm, an, I'm an affiliate of Moat. And uh, I, before COVID, was going there every spring and and working. Um, the Moat, Moat Laboratory is building a new aquarium further north on Route 75. And I think uh, we're getting all that space back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Dr. Kaufman, a question uh, actually from me. You mentioned in the start of your talk, I think, telling us about the Belizean restoration coral project that the transplanted coral became reproductively active at a much younger age. Is that correct? Yeah, age in corals is not about years, it's about size. So when the colony reaches a certain size, it somehow knows it's time to have sex. Um, so you can artificially create an anomalously large colony by taking lots of bits uh, from one colony and spreading them a few inches apart from each other. And then as soon as they reunite, they go, oh, I'm grown up. <laughs> time to have sex. <laughs> oh, that's a good way of doing it. It's kind of gross if you imagine it in human terms, but yeah. Yeah. There was a, actually another comment, uh, just uh, thanking you from a wonderful, for a wonderful presentation from one of our colleagues in our geography and sustainability uh, department. And he, uh, you could probably see this conveys yeah. his concerns about the multiple stresses, including pollution, et cetera. Uh, he doesn't ask a question, but what's your view on all the, the impact and how we can overcome the pollution that's uh, flooding off the shores into these coral communities. Well, I think I think the essential change here is to go back to the Polynesian way of viewing the world, which is actually common to indigenous peoples all over the world. They understand that they're part of a system and that the system is connected and that you don't do bad things to it unless you want bad things to happen to you. So the modern terminology for this is ecosystem-based management. That's still like a presumptuous construct, like we're managing, but what we're managing is us. So if we manage us with an understanding of how we relate to the system and how to behave as a responsible individual, that takes care of everything. Now, we were just hired a while ago by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. They're the, they're the federal agency responsible for what goes on on the Outer Continental Shelf. And um, the other guys, well, they're the drill baby drill guys, I guess. But now <clears throat> they've been mandated by President Biden to massively accelerate the build out of renewable energy offshore. Offshore because that's where the least land disputes are at the moment. It's not that there aren't people 
who are pissed about this is that it's not as bad as if you did it in the middle of Iowa, which we should also be doing. So our job for Bohm is to help them shift from looking at problems piecemeal to adopting an ecosystem-based approach. And so for that purpose, we're writing a national framework, like philosophically, how do you do this? And we're creating a model, one of our minds models, uh, with one of those dynamic models that project, they don't tell you what's gonna happen. They just project what's likely to happen if you do this or that. So it forecasts scenarios that are possible. And then you try to nudge it one way or the other. This concept was articulated beautifully by Isaac Asimov in the science fiction trilogy, The Foundation. And now there's a TV series of at least the beginning of it. And there was a hero in there named Harry Seldon, a professor who came up with this mathematics called psychohistory that could help you understand likely outcomes. Harry Seldon is my hero. And I've assembled a team at Boston University now that is looking at the world both with theory-based models like MIMES and theory-free models, what we used to call chaos math, and is now better known as machine learning. So we're hybridizing machine learning with process or theory-based models so that they can inform each other, which is how science works, deductive, inductive, back and forth. So we're trying to use modern computational tools and sensing apparatus and things like that to take a jump in how we do this. Sorry, that was ended, but that's it. <laughs> Sounds really exciting. And I, I must apologize to my colleague, Dr. Scott Gale. I think I jumped a question, Nelson, sorry. Oh. No, I, I think we're probably uh, at our time limit, and um, if that's okay, I th thank you very much, Dr. Kaufman, for a wonderful presentation.